Good evening, everybody. My name is Hadley Gamble, and I'm the Middle East anchor for CNBC News. I'm joined by an exciting panel of guests, experts in their fields, and we're going to be talking about what are the conditions to create global happiness. Now, this is something, of course, that the UAE is really driving. Um, you've had a lot of support from the U UAE's government, but there are questions about how do you take these uh, methodologies, how do you take this data and really apply it elsewhere in the world? And I think that's something that all of these panelists are really going to be able to tap into. And what we also want, of course, is some interaction from the audience. We're going to be taking audience questions. So if you have a question, be loud, be proud, and stick your head up, and we'll try to get to you as quickly as possible as well. Um, I want to kick off with our first panelist, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs. I want to ask you about what exactly is in this report? Because as I look through it, I noticed some things like, War and peace. War is the most detrimental thing to global happiness, according to this report. I have questions about AI. Certainly being addicted to your smartphone doesn't seem to be making people happy, and in fact could actually lead to more mental illness and unhappiness. So talk us through, I think, what this actually means and if this is applicable globally. Great. Well, thank you very much, and especially thanks to our host, uh, the United Arab Emirates, which had the idea of having a global happiness council and a global happiness dialogue, which is why we're all together. And it's a wonderful idea, and I think it's going to sweep the world. And I, I want to start actually just with one observation which uh, just came to mind. Uh, there's an old adage in philosophy that you should judge the quality of philosophy by the philosopher, actually. Uh, were they happy? Were they dismal? Ayn Rand, for example, was a, a nasty, unhappy woman. <laughs> True story. True story. Unhappy, and she spread unhappiness. And if you read her stuff, it's not exactly philosophy, it's bad fiction, but it's nasty stuff. Whereas I can tell you, and this is honest to God truth, the people you're about to hear from, not me, but all the others, they're really happy. They're really <laughs> nice people. This is proof of just daily life that if you uh, teach happiness, if you propound the ideas of giving, if you propound, uh, propound a, a, an altruistic uh, philosophy, you're actually happier. And as you know, uh, at our meeting, uh, Matu Ricard, probably some of you have seen him, uh, the world's happiest person by uh, neuroscientific evidence. He's really a nice person. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to say, first of all, this is true stuff. Second, this is priced for your happiness. It's free. <laughs> so you should get it, and you should read it, because it's, you could skip my little bit at the beginning. But the other chapters are really good. And the idea of this is that there is a community of experts who for quite a long time, I hope that's all right to say, have been saying there's a better way to well-being. And my good luck was that uh, the prime minister's office was so kind to ask me to help assemble that group, that was easy because I knew the list of luminaries uh, to contact who were, uh, are really the experts in this and being happy, good people, they all said yes uh, immediately uh, and uh, being the good people they are, they're all very happy they said yes also uh, and they produced this report. So. It's also online, so tell your friends, your uh, children, your students, that it is at happinesscouncil.org to uh, download. Because actually we need to get a report of this quality known. So CNBC is gonna be running this as the lead story all week. <laughs> no matter what happens, it's going to open the news every hour it's going to make the stock market go back up, <laughs> and it's going to bring a lot of joy. And the policymakers, because Donald Trump watches TV, he's going to look at it, and he's going to become <laughs> a much happier person as a result of this. So the idea is 
that a lot is known, actually, about improving our mental functioning individually and about improving our social lives, whether it is in school, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's helping people with the uh, depressive uh, disorder, for example, which is what uh, Richard Laird uh, will talk about uh, in a moment, one of the most basic interventions to help people get over uh, serious problems and things can be done and typically in our world are not done, by the way. So this is a compendium of important case studies of what to do. And then we want to hear back from you because we've been brainstorming the last two days. How do we get this to all the grumpy finance ministers of the world? that make the budgets that say, no, we're not, we can't spend money on happiness. We have to spend money on the military or whatever they're spending on. Uh, so uh, quite seriously, that's what this is all about. So it's about messaging as well. It's about saying that there really is now, if I could say it, a science of happiness. Uh, it is positive psychology with which uh, uh, Professor uh, Marty Seligman uh, developed uh, with, with colleagues and leads worldwide. It is uh, the measurement and um, policy uh, study of happiness with which uh, Lord Richard Layard uh, has been the pioneer with our colleague John Helliwell. Uh, it is a government organization for even being aware of this because how many governments are even paying attention to the fact that you can measure happiness, assess it, study it, understand it is not in the morning briefings in the White House, unfortunately. Not yet, but we have an idea to get it there. Uh, and uh, Martine Durand, who is uh, uh, the chief statistician and uh, leader of OECD's remarkable efforts in this area, also the lead of uh, one of the thematic groups, goes through in the report all the governments that are doing something, and there are probably about 25 or how many? 22. 22. 22. But remember, I'm at the UN, there are 193 governments in the UN. So the idea is. Uh, 193 minus 22 is 171 last time I checked. That's our mission, uh, is we have to get this out to the world community. Thanks to the UAE, you have a Minister of Happiness, a wonderful Minister of Happiness. She is our guide and leader in this effort, and that's why, and the Prime Minister, of course, is a great champion of this. And the idea of the World Government Summit is to make this known. That's the idea. Okay, so in terms of the finance ministers, obviously if you're a fan of CNBC, which I know everyone in this room yeah, must exactly. be, um, you're, you're talking to the right people. But my question would be then, um, with all of this research and all of the ability to quantify um, happiness and what it takes and what it means, how do you then, you go to a government and you say, okay, so war is the greatest threat to <laughs> happiness. So you have to change your entire foreign policy? I mean, are they going to look at you and say, oh, get this guy out of the room? So uh, I'm, I'm the guy that wrote about war at the beginning because I come from a, unfortunately, a warlike country that has been addicted to war for a while. And we're not very happy. And our happiness in the United States has been going down for the last 30, it's been stuck or stuck for a while. Now we're in almost a free fall. Uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, it's not a partisan thing, by the way. It's just a society that's losing its uh, grip. And so I would think the U.S. would be happier if we weren't bombing so many places. So I invented a rule, I call it Sachs's foreign policy rule number one, which is you're not allowed to bomb any country where half the Americans cannot name two cities in the country. Uh, <laughs> Which would and cut things down significantly. This would end all war, believe me. <laughs> all war. Uh, so uh, this, this is uh, what I'm trying to propound.
but there are also other practical ways because it's not just uh, the military which is a source of huge unhappiness usually for people that are under the bombs but also it's in the clinics it's in the schools it's in the workplace uh, it's in the halls of government because government should be thinking about these things what does uh, our government talk about well you know in, you read the tweets in the morning uh, all sorts of things but mainly stock markets up or it's not up or uh, war um, so it's all about the economy uh, but the point here is there's a lot that isn't about that and um, that's why when you run this as lead story every hour clearly and the finance ministers are tuned to CNBC which they are of course and they're gonna watch the market for happiness happiness is rising uh, and they can all uh, invest forward in a rising happiness market because the stocks may be going down now, but happiness could go up. Oh, we hope all so. All right. Okay. <laughs> Good. I think I'm going to turn to Richard now. Okay. And Richard, you worked on the mental health aspect of this report. And one of the things that we at CNBC cover often are all of the technological innovations that are changing our world today, including artificial intelligence, what that's going to mean for jobs, job growth, and in terms of how that impacts you mentally. Talk us through what's happening, what we're seeing in the rest of the world today, because the big questions on everybody's mind are these technological innovations. Yes, they're good for society, but are they really good for us? Well, I've, I've got a few slides I want to show, which are up there, Go if that's all right. So, uh, what, what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about depression, uh, not diagnosed, but measurable in the population by asking people questions. Diagnosable depression of a clinically significant level and anxiety disorders, PTSD, agoraphobia, panic attacks. Something like 10% minimum in every single region of the world. So the first point that I want to make is that this is actually one of the most serious causes of misery uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, I've come at this by looking at uh, data, uh, first on richer countries, but more recently uh, on all countries using the Gallup World Poll. So let me show you uh, what I find. You can see in rich countries, uh, as a cause of misery, uh, mental illness is the biggest single cause of misery, uh, more important than poverty or unemployment or physical illness. When you come to low-income countries, it gets reversed. Poverty is the most important. Uh, but then mental illness comes in again, and it comes in again as important as physical illness as, as affecting the quality of life. This is just not the way most people see the world because they're hidden away. Most physically ill people are more visible than most mentally ill people. But that is the truth of it. Uh, and and uh, that's one reason why we should deal with it, the quality of life. Next reason is that it is actually a killer. Um, the, the death rate of people uh, with uh, anxiety disorders is nearly 50% higher than uh, 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 ordinary people without. Um, and depression, which of course is the main cause of suicide, um, is even uh, higher. So it, it, it's the quality of life and the length of life. But also, if we have any, any, anyone here from the finance ministry, any hands up? Thanks, wonderful. <laughs> uh, there's also the economic cost. Um, so uh, worldwide, uh, mental illness accounts for a third of disability. Uh, it accounts for a half of absenteeism uh, and presenteeism, meaning low productivity at work. And in richer countries, where there is a physical healthcare system uh, well established, mental illness causes the, a person with a given physical illness to consume 50% more uh, physical health care. So that's another big cost. So these are uh, serious numbers for finance ministers uh, to look at. Given all that, what is so extraordinary uh, is the undertreatment. Jeff mentioned it. Um, even in rich countries, uh, you've only got a quarter of people with these conditions uh, being uh, treated. Uh, and uh, in low countries, of course, it, it's very much less. I mean, if this was a physical illness in a rich country, to have only a quarter of people in treatment would create an outcry. And it's only because of stigma and the effect of mental illness 
on the person and their family, that you don't see people protesting in the streets. Uh, the, the pattern of foreign aid is even more extraordinary, actually. Uh, there's almost no foreign aid uh, for mental illness, even though, as I'll show you, there are very good treatments. Uh, compared with AIDS, mental illness accounts for much more um, of the burden of disease as cal calculated by WHO than AIDS does, and yet the uh, uh, foreign aid is completely skewed. So that's the bad news. Let me give you the good news. <laughs> okay. Uh, the good news is that we've got effective treatments. Most of these have been developed in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, especially the psychological therapies. So for depression, we've got a variety of evidence-based talking therapies based on thousands of trials. Uh, we've also got medication, though actually medication in Britain is only recommended for severe depression. Of course, it's mainly given for non-severe depression, but it shouldn't be. Uh, so medication is, is a, a smallish part of the uh, toolkit. For anxiety disorders, the main toolkit is cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and what we can pretty much guarantee is that after not more than an average of, say, seven sessions, that's what we have in Britain, uh, you will have a 50% recovery rate within that period uh, from these conditions, of which for anxiety, this is more or less permanent, uh, for depression, it halves the rate of, of relapse, and we've also got uh, good treatments for child uh, behavior disorders. Um, so, so that's the fact that we can treat it, but can we afford to treat it? Well, I think from what I've said, you'll, you'll, you'll think we should be treating it, but the even more extraordinary fact is that because uh, mental illness, unlike in rich countries at least, physical illness, mainly of which is a disease of retirement. <laughs> Mental illness is a disease mainly of working age, so the economic costs are, are, are much greater uh, than of physical illnesses, at least in rich countries. And uh, what you can see, therefore, is that you get a huge payback uh, by treating uh, an illness like depression because you get the, the increase in people's ability to work. These are the WH calculations here that for a dollar spent uh, on treating depression, uh, you get a payback uh, of three and a half dollars. Uh, and similarly for uh, anxiety disorders. So um, the, uh, the payback actually uh, m to the health service itself is probably at least one for one. And, the, and then there's the payback in terms of GDP. So, what we need, obviously, is from every country uh, a, a proper plan to deal with this uh, mental health problem. Um, the WHO have persuaded countries to agree to do it, but uh, some are dragging their feet. Um, and what a group of uh, WHO researchers have suggested is that at a minimum target, uh, we should be treating at least 25% of uh, extra of the population. So a poor country that's hardly treating anybody should be treating uh, just over 25%. Rich countries should go up from 25% to 50% uh, by 2030. And what's the cost of that? Look, the massive number, the massive number is 0.1% of GDP. It is amazing that everybody hasn't just put a plan in place for such a tiny cost, especially given that it will be repaid uh, 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 probably twice over. So countries need to decide uh, on the treatments they intend to uh, provide to which uh, groups of uh, the population. They need to set in, in motion a proper training program on, in evidence-based treatments, uh, and then they need to deliver proper services, properly supervised, uh, and so on. Uh, in rich countries, these should be a thoroughly professional uh, group of, uh, of workers. Uh, in poorer countries, they may have to be uh, sub-professionals, uh, but we need clarity and, and uh, good training programs is the absolute essence of, of a plan. Here are some examples. This is what this book is about, examples of good practice. Britain uh, started with uh, almost nobody being treated with anxiety disorders or uh, depression, now treating half a million annually, well-trained. Uh, Chile 
put in place a similar program with a similar uh, rate of expansion relative to population. Uh, Pakistan has got a good program uh, for maternal depression, uh, a huge problem for mothers and their children. There's an emerald, so-called emerald program involving six countries in Africa and Asia, um, which is the implementing the WHO package and of course digital treatments are very important. I'm not going to talk about promotion of mental health because uh, Marty and Jan are going to be talking about it. I just want to make two more points. First, we should also think about promotion um, amongst citizens. And I do want to make sure everybody here uh, knows about a wonderful movement called Action for Happiness. Mark is the director. Wave your arm. Mark is there. Anyone can find out about it from Mark. Um, we have uh, increasing numbers worldwide of groups of people who meet together regularly around the issue of what matters most in life, along the altruistic agenda that Jeff outlined. Uh, here is the wonderful course that they start with, eight sessions, called Exploring What Matters, which raises life satisfaction and trust uh, by, on average, uh, a point. So uh, please look into uh, the, the web for Action for Happiness. I just want to end with a word on the campaign, which we're all on, uh, to try and get more governments to take well-being as their objective. Um, how can we get policymakers to do this? Certainly one of the obstacles has always been that they offer, but we don't have the information to do it. Uh, well, uh, part of that excuse has been undermined by a very important recent publication, <laughs> The Origins of Happiness, <laughs> I'm not the lead author, <laughs> uh, but uh, that provides a, a, a massive number of coefficients because, of course, to do proper cost effectiveness with uh, happiness as the measure of benefit, you've got to have lots of coefficients. Uh, you can find them in there. So I think it's becoming easier and easier uh, to evaluate policy on the basis of its well-being uh, effects. And I do think that in, in 20 years' time, uh, most countries will be doing it. We have one that's doing it here. Uh, who's going to be second? Third? Let's, let's, let's let everybody here try and be second and third. Thank you very much. So Richard, following on to that, really it seems to me, at least from, I guess, a media perspective, is that you have all of the data and governments as a result of this report and a certain book that was just promo, um, they have the data now, and there seems to be no excuse considering it's actually going to save them money in the long haul to treat mental illness, for example. But I want to bring in Martin Seligman now to talk about education, because part of this is not just getting your message out, but it's also about educating people at a very young age about things like mental health and why it's so important to address these concerns, isn't it? Um. Freud and Schopenhauer told us that the best we could ever do in life was not to be miserable. A good life was a life that held suffering as close to zero as possible. And uh, I believe that what we're about today uh, tells us that they were empirically wrong. It's a moral, morally insidious view and it's a political dead end. Human beings can do much more than not be miserable. And uh, uh, where can happiness start? And our, our chapter uh, takes the premise that learning to be happy uh, can start in school. And so this is a, a material that Alejandro and I wrote. And, um, what we do is uh, we scan the globe for programs that are teaching well-being and happiness to children in school. And we limited ourselves in two ways, that the programs had to measure well-being, measure positive emotion, engagement, good relationships, meaning and purpose, accomplishment, measure depression, anxiety, and anger. So they had to have measurement, and they also had to measure school achievement. I'll tell you why in a moment. And that these programs use validated interventions that build happiness and build well-being. There are about a dozen interventions that have been through 
random assignment placebo controlled testing that build well-being. So that, that was the criteria that we used. And uh, what we found in reviewing uh, the world was that uh, tens of thousands of teachers around the world have now been trained in these programs uh, and hundreds of thousands of children around the world. And uh, uh, you can see the, the nations that do this, uh, uh, Australia, the UK, the United States, Dubai, Chile, Mexico, Peru, uh, Bhutan and the like. And uh, Alejandro travels the world and says to ministers of education, let's build happiness, let's build well-being in children. And the first response that uh, Alejandro gets from a tough-minded uh, minister is, look, school is a zero-sum game. We have a budget. You want to teach kids to be happy, well, what are you going to cut out? Geometry? Music? And so the question arose whether or not happy children, whether or not when children learn these techniques that increase well-being, what happens to national standardized exams? So Alejandro did three remarkable studies, Bhutan, Mexico, and Peru, in which, uh, I'll, I'll describe them in a moment, in which he gave uh, positive intervention training to the teachers. The teachers then uh, teach the students and then he asks a year later and two years later, did this raise happiness? And most importantly, what happened to national standardized exams? So this was Alejandro's first study. Uh, it involved uh, 18 schools in Bhutan. Bhutan was very cooperative, uh, being a, a prime area interested in building well-being. Um, and first he found, uh, uh, 11 schools, the teachers learned the techniques of positive education. Uh, and in the control schools, the teachers have a retreat in which they learn psychological techniques, nutrition and the like, but not about happiness. And so Alejandro then looked uh, a year later and two years later, and first he found naturally that, that uh, the schools in which happiness was taught, happiness went up. But the important thing was what happened to the national standardized exams. Uh, and here you see that the schools in which the children learn well-being have markedly higher uh, literacy, numeracy, and scientific understanding by national uh, criteria. Uh, so that was the first major study. He then went to his home country, Mexico, and uh, uh, did the same thing, in this case, with uh, about 70,000 children. Uh, again, half of them getting uh, the teachers learn positive interventions. They teach them to, to uh, the kids. And uh, half the schools uh, have, are a control group. And again, he found uh, a year later that the schools in which uh, the children learn well-being have higher well-being, but most importantly, they have higher national standardized exam results. And finally, uh, with the World Bank, Alejandro went to Peru, uh, 700 schools, 690,000 children, did the same thing. Uh, and again, the schools in which well-being is taught, uh, well-being goes up. Uh, but most importantly for a, a principal or a minister of education, national standardized exams go up. Uh, and uh, uh, that convinced, that's the most convincing evidence I've seen, that it's not only intrinsically a good thing to teach happiness to children, but if all you care about is this ins instrumental value uh, in increasing grade point average, you should do it. Uh, the final thing we did in uh, the chapter was uh, uh, to make recommendations. One of the important things about uh, Jeff's endeavor, this is the first volume. Next year's volume uh, will be the question of how to do this. And our recommendations have to do this, that what's needed in the area of positive education is good measurement of how big an effect this is 
and how long it lasts. Uh, we need to measure the fidelity of interventions, whether or not people are doing it well, and whether or not um, the results occur, uh, co-occur with doing it well. Uh, we need a cost-benefit analysis. We need to know how much this costs and what the long-term financial benefits are. Uh, and uh, finally, we need uh, uh, to do this over a long period of time and ask in different cultures. So we adapt the material to the culture, but we need to ask how culturally specific it is. So m my conclusion from this work uh, is that um, everyone wants to make children happy. Well, it turns out there are validated techniques that raise the positive emotion, engagement, the relationships that children have, and the meaning they have in life. And uh, that's intrinsically valuable in and of itself. Uh, but most importantly, doing this increases the usual goals of school. Uh, uh, going to the workplace, uh, literacy, numeracy, scientific understanding. And so we have a case here in which happiness and achievement uh, go hand in hand. And uh, we are most grateful to uh, uh, the Emirates for uh, sponsoring this research and telling the world that this is a beacon for the future of our young people. Thank you. So when we talk about education and the positive impact education can have, I think it's interesting to note that you know, we're talking about how to start this um, well-being and this move toward happiness with young people, but what about the rest of us who are already there and in the workplace? Jan Emanuel, if you want to take that on, because if you're already in the workplace, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I'd rather be a little happier than I am, so tell me, yeah. what is it we don't know? Well, I we'll hear about the workplace, but uh, I think the evidence is mounting in this book, uh, uh, shows the mass of it, that for the rest of us, in our work, in our leisure, in our relationships, that the building of happiness not only produces more happiness, it produces more productivity, less burnout, uh, more satisfaction with what you're doing. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the great shift that we're talking about here is from the alleviation of misery, which Richard just talked about. I spent the first half of my life uh, uh, professionally working on the worst kinds of misery, suicide, depression, anxiety, panic, divorce, drug abuse, schizophrenia. And I think I'm, we've reached an upper limit on what we can do. I wrote five editions of Abnormal Psychology over 25 years. And there was no improvement beyond the 50%, 60% rate on the reduction of misery. So that's why I asked the question, well, maybe we can do something else. So instead of attacking misery directly, maybe we could buffer against misery by building well-being. And we have a book coming out this year called Positive Psychotherapy, in which instead of doing the usual stuff in psychotherapy, we do in psychotherapy what you do in schools with the kids. And that works at least as well as antidepressant drugs and cognitive behavioral therapy. So I, um, it's such a pleasure to be able to report and brief you all on the, the results of, of the work that we've done in the, as the Workplace Happiness Committee. Um, and we took advantage of this uh, first report to really provide an empirical foundation uh, for the future work on workplace happiness. And so we started by asking really the most basic question of all, which is just how important is work for our well-being? And then for the vast majority of people who are in work, we wanted to have a global state of job satisfaction and employee engagement. And if we want to increase on these metrics that are all so important, as you'll find out, that we need to find out what it is about our jobs, which job characteristics in specific are the ones that are driving happiness or unhappiness. 
And so that's obviously what we set out to do, and I'll say a little bit more about this soon, and we've got recommendations that came out of that kind of work. Now, as you will have noticed, I've got quite some ground to cover in the next uh, six or seven minutes, and so if it feels like I'm rushing you through this material, then it is because I am rushing you through this material, but I'm hoping that you will be excited and motivated enough to dig into our report and delve much deeper in the details of our analyses and especially the recommendations for your organizations. So with that being said, let's move on and ask that very basic question around just how important is work for our well-being? And if you look at the world's data on how people evaluate the quality of their lives, you'll find that the average around the world is about five out of 10. But split it up into the population that is employed and the population that is unemployed, and there's a gap opening up between these two populations in terms of their uh, self-reported life satisfaction or life evaluation. People in work or employed report about being about 20% happier than people outside of work. So that's a big gap. There's very few things that have that much impact on people's well-being as being in work or outside of work. And we believe it is because it's not just the pay associated with a job, it's the fact that it provides a purpose. It's the fact that it provides you with social relationships. It's the fact that it provides you uh, with a structure and a routine through your day. So these things are important. Now, if you look at negative emotions from being unemployed, it's through the roof. In fact, people around the world are 50% more likely to be reporting negative emotions such as anxiety and stress and worry as people in a job. So it's hard to deny the importance of work for well-being as a whole. So that is the first foundation. Now, for the majority of people who are in work, luckily the majority of people, until AI will come around, but we'll talk about that in chapter two or chapter three, two or three years from now. But if you're in work, then just how are you evaluating on the job satisfaction or employee engagement? And you'll find that these two concepts that are the concepts that are most used in the workplace in terms of measuring well-being actually give us very different answers, but make a lot of sense nonetheless. The first one is job satisfaction. This is the good news. On average, around the world, about 80% of people are actually satisfied with their job. <coughs> but job satisfaction is a relatively low bar to clear. It means that you're sort of pleased to have a job in the first place as compared to not having one. So that's what we think people pick up intuitively when they respond to how satisfied they are with their jobs. A whole different picture appears when we look at employee engagement. That's a much higher bar to clear. It means that you have to identify with your work, with the mission of your firm or organization, and that's a much tougher bar to clear, as we can tell from the data, because only about 20% of people actually report being actively engaged with their work. Think about this for a second, and I want to point to European nations back home that are only seeing about, what is it, um, 11, 12% of people actively engaged in their jobs? So what we take away from this very basic sort of foundational level of empirical work is, yeah, people are pleased to have a job, but there's a massive room for improvement in making the job qualitatively better and getting people engaged with their work. So we've got more, much more work to do on that. But where do we start? Well, we start by exploring what it is on the job that motivates people and induces their happiness or unhappiness. And so that's what we did next. Turns out there's one data set that actually has these data. It's called the International Social Survey Program, and it's got data on a whole host of countries and very granular level aspects of how you rate your job, and that obviously in relation to job satisfaction. And so that will range about how much you're being paid in the job, to how many hours you're working, to the work-life balance or imbalance in some cases, whether the job is secure, or whether you find the job intrinsically interesting, and the number of relationships, as we'll see very important indeed, the interpersonal relationships that you develop on the job. If we had more time, I would ask, be asking you to sit, stand still for a moment and think about which aspects, which of these 12 clusters of job characteristics are most important, say, for you in your job, or for most people in general, in your opinion. But cutting the chase, I suppose, because we wouldn't have time for that, um, I'll show you the results. Turns out, to no surprise, all of the, the, these dimensions matter, but some matter much more than others. And let's look at the economic one first. We, old-fashioned economists, would be able, would be saying, <coughs> needless to say, that it's about the pay you, you, you um, get from the work you do. And 
it'd be uh, naive to think that there is no association between pay and job satisfaction. But the really cool result here is other aspects of, jo of your job are more than twice as important. So if you look, for example, at finding a job intrinsically interesting, or especially the interpersonal relationships, the social capital that you gain from the job, turns out to be twice as important as the pay you get from the job in driving your job satisfaction. On the negative front, it's work-life imbalance and finding a job very harsh and stressful. These are the things that are as important and perhaps even more important than the pay associated, even though that's the classic thing that we tend to be taught in economics or what people think about when they think of a job most often of the time. So those are the ones that we need to work on and obviously lead to a number of recommendations uh, that we kind of compiled and summarized for you with a number of case studies in the report. So I really um, urge you to look into the report to find out more. But the four recommendations that we really want to work on with you is, first of all, improving work-life balance. So introducing flexible um, work uh, practices can really have a significant, there's a lot of evidence for this having significant impact on both employee satisfaction as well as their performance, and especially within performance, retention of employees, which is then very good for the bottom line of organizations. A second recommendation that we have is essential skills training. Came as a bit of a surprise to me because after, for most individuals in work, turns out that after uh, having studied, maybe many years ago, there aren't many opportunities to learn anymore. And the best place to still learn is on the job. And a lot of people don't have, haven't gotten much education to begin with. And so essential skills, such as improving literacy, which may seem striking to you as it did to me, is actually a very valuable thing for many workplaces with long-term, down-the-line uh, positive implications for the individuals themselves and the company. Right? A third recommendation that we really suggest and, and develop in the, in the report, or in our chapter on the report, is autonomy. There's a fantastic program called the STAR program, which has pro provided enormous evidence, causal evidence, for the fact that changing that work culture more towards um, uh, results-driven and providing more autonomy for employees on the job is really helpful indeed. The final recommendation, and perhaps the strongest one coming out of our results, as you just saw, is the importance of these relationships on the job. But what I didn't tell you is, amongst these relationships, there's one that stands out. It's the one with your boss. And what we know, and it's typically in the wrong direction, I should have added. But the good news is, is that we kind of know what people appreciate most in a boss. There's a lot of really good empirical evidence that we compile in the report on this. It turns out it's both competence and supportive management, being able to support the people that work for you. These are two elements that stand out. And there's a lot, even though there's already a great focus on it, there's a lot more that we can do on these two elements, right? So competence and supportive managers. And so senior leaders in organizations ought to both recruit and skill even more, or put more effort into, the, um, into managers that they select have these particular qualities, because the enormous benefits that will achieve for the workforce at large are, are at large are currently underestimated. All right, much more in the report in our chapter. Um, but looking ahead, final slide, just to conclude, just to say that we've now got this amazing foundation, I think, in this chapter. And for the next chapter, we want to make the business case. We want to round up all the great evidence and add some ourselves to it to, add, to make the business case for why companies and organizations are it's not just the right thing to do to put well-being at the heart of their workplace, but also the, the smart thing to do from a bottom line perspective. And so there's a lot to be said about that. And maybe a third chapter, we're exploring thoughts about the future of work, of which there was a lot of talk at the summit, but what was less, much less talked about is the impact on well-being of the, the notion of the future of work. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Much more research is needed, and I think in two years' time, we'll be ready to write it up. So stay tuned, and uh, thank you. We talked about mental health. We talked about well-being in the workplace, I think, which was quite interesting in terms of uh, the list of things that people most um, cite as making them pleased with their daily lives in that sense, and then also about the importance of, of education as well um, and starting people off on the right path. But I just want to take a few minutes quickly before we change panelists to open it up for the audience in terms of some questions. And I know we have a microphone, so if you just raise your hand, I think the, man, the mic can get to you. Hi. Uh, my question is exactly <clears throat> where Jan Emanuel left it, on the unemployed and future of work. 
fourth industrial revolution and so on, one of the solutions offered to those challenges that are coming up with fourth industrial revolution is universal basic income. And people would say universal basic income will not save us because if you're just being paid but you don't have a job, you're unhappy. Because as we know, unemployment kills your happiness much more than just foregone income. So maybe it's because you know that if you're <coughs> unemployed in the future, you're less likely to accumulate skills, come back to the labor force and so on. However, some, some other people would say, well, you have universal basic income forever, so even if you don't have a job, you should not have any stress because your life in the future is not as much at risk. Where are you standing on this? Maybe you or, or maybe Jeff as well. Let, let me uh, just say a, a word about this. The, the real part of the answer is um, some uh, income redistribution. Universal basic income is one example of that. I don't think it's the right one, personally, uh, because there are many, many ways to help, uh, help people uh, and redistribute income with also training and so on. But another part is there'll be more leisure time over time. And for a lot of societies, there's going to be declining uh, labor force uh, because population has peaked. So it would not be the worst thing in the world for people to also have leisure time, vacation time, time for volunteer work. The point about all of these new technologies is that they raise overall productivity in the society. The question for us is, will we leave all of those gains in the hands of six people? Is this all about uh, Larry Page, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, Bill Gates uh, and a few others, or is it for the benefit of the whole society? If we go the second route, we can have higher well-being, we can have more leisure time, more time for volunteerism, more time for human uh, activities, and uh, more material well-being. The real problem with this is the income distribution. Right now, <coughs> five companies, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, and Microsoft are worth $3.6 trillion. Unbelievable. The income that's gone to the top is unbelievable. And they're getting tax cuts from the US <coughs> government, which is unbelievable. And so that's not the, that may be the way to happiness for six people, but it's not the way to happiness for the rest of us. And that's the real answer, I think, to this question. I'd like to comment as well, if I may, on that. Flow is uh, the psychological state in which time stops for you. You feel completely at home. Uh, statistically, people have more of that at work than in leisure or at home, at one point. And the second is, um, I think human beings ineluctably want meaning and purpose in life. And work provides that, one of the routes to it. <clears throat> I just want to second what was said, and in a way your question already had the answer to it in it, which is great universal basic income is a good start, but people need to think about sort of an expanded universal basic income that also involves aspects of purpose and meaning, a routine throughout your day, and so on and so forth. So it's a good start, but we need to do much better. I just want to take one more question before we move on to our next round of panelists. Can I ask a question? So, um, Lord Laird and, and Dr. Deneuve, both of you have spoken about a cost-benefit analysis and making the business case. We are living in a resource-restrained world. Population is increasing. How are we going to not use happiness in terms of making that cost-benefit analysis, in terms of making the case, uh, the business case, not use happiness as a way to increase GDP, to increase our personal wealth, to increase our consumption. So how, how, do you, how do you bridge that ask so that we can really see that transformation in our economy, in our government, and in our personal lives, and save our environment if there's a possibility of that? But I, I think one of the main uh, messages is that the uh, all-for-growth approach doesn't produce happiness. 
Uh, and in fact, it was the one of the observations that started uh, uh, a, a lot of the uh, policy work was that the United States tripled its income per person without uh, an increase in the uh, reported uh, well-being uh, by the population. That's been going on for 50 years. More recently, the well-being has been declining. So I think it's an answer to your question also. We're chasing the wrong thing if we're just chasing growth. Uh, and this uh, approach absolutely calls on us to understand that our well-being depends on many things, especially on social relations, on mental health, on quality in the workplace. And the approaches we've been taking may produce a rise of measured national income, but are not doing much for the population. Uh, and we're saying, at the bottom of all of this, it's about the quality of lives, the meaning of lives, the well-being of uh, people. And so I think it really addresses exactly the concern you're talking about. I, I'd love to come in on this, if I may. Um, so I, Jeff is right. The ultimate goal, obviously, is, is the well-being of people. And I think you agree with that. But your point was very subtle. It was like, when I talk about the business case, for, for um, and, and Richard talks about cost-benefit analysis, in a way, we're monetizing or instrumentalizing well-being again. I think we're doing it for the good reasons, which is we all believe that well-being is, is what should be driving policy and business leaders. But not all of them are convinced at this point. And so one way of convincing them is making the business case, that it is not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do for your bottom line, or the smart thing to do in terms of spending uh, uh, the, the limited budgets you have in government. So there's a sequence here, I think. It will help convince those that aren't yet fully convinced. But the ultimate goal has to be the well-being of people themselves. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. And if I could invite our next group of panelists to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to kick off now um, with Dr. Robert Denier and uh, personal happiness. How do we get there? I mean, we've heard reasons and, and uh, that we should be you know, forcing governments and policymakers to get on board here. But at the end of the day, part of this has to be your own personal will and decision, doesn't it? So do you want me to go up there and give a presentation or just to answer your question? Oh, you could do either, but we love, we love Q&A. We love Q&A. Um, talk to me a little bit about something that we touched on just briefly, and it's something that I want to get at before we get out of here tonight, which is the movement of technology and, and how fast it's moving and how it's become such a big part of our daily lives. And it's something that I uh, hear about quite often, which is that you know, with the rise of AI and the questions surrounding what that's going to do to the job market, yes, it makes our society so much better, technology, but at the same point, it could mean we're losing jobs, which means we could be losing our purpose. And at the same time, is it really worrying as a parent that your child stays on their phone for most of the time unless you rip it away from them? I mean, what are these things, these technologies, doing to our ability to affect our own happiness? Well, I think that most people would agree that technology is a tool, and to the extent that um, that tool is misused, it could create harm. There's certainly uh, mounting evidence that even the presence of cell phones reduces connection trust, increases uh, feelings of jealousy. Um, if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that's both in the laboratory and in naturalistic settings, they find that. Um, but that's not to say that a phone isn't also useful. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't want to all throw our phones away just because, you know, someone's made jealous by it. Um, same thing, if, if um, AI replaces some jobs, it doesn't mean that those jobs will not necessarily migrate elsewhere. Um, it just is, I think it represents a shift in, in society and economy. And so then what is the recipe for personal happiness? <laughs> Given your research. Yeah. <laughs> that I have to answer there, I think. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah. You got it quicker. I'll keep this uh, very brief, and I'll start just with a couple of important lessons. First, I just used the standard shampoo and conditioner provided by the hotel. Um, so that, that answers that for you. 
Um, my father once told me if you ever present on happiness at the very end of the day and everyone is tired, it's best to start with uh, showing people statistical effect sizes. And I took that to heart, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, it's interesting in this analysis of uh, Gallup World Poll data by University of Utah researcher uh, Danielle Geerling, you can see that there are variables that we think of as individual variables, variables such as, as health, um, your educational status, your age. But we find, uh, in general, that the effect sizes uh, between um, the, showing the relation between these and, and various forms of happiness, life satisfaction and positive emotion, range from very small to medium. But when you look at more social, you know, pull back for larger than the individual to, to the social level, you find much larger effect sizes. So the overall uh, happiness ranking of a country, so the country is now the variable instead of the individual, now you start seeing effect sizes ranging from medium to very large. And I think it's interesting because we are here talking about how can we convince policymakers to adopt happiness policy, but I think at least one part of the obstacle is that this aspect of understanding happiness is slightly counterintuitive, which is that happiness is something more than a subjective phenomenon. And, and it's not to disparage the, the laudable efforts of my colleagues, because I do believe that we should do individual intervention. We should educate people. We should do character uh, education. We should try to improve people's mental health. We should try to improve their optimism, their mindset, their joy. Those are all individual interventions, though. And it turns out that there's a, a, a second level of intervention, and that's just societal level uh, interventions. There is a difference between individual happiness and social happiness. That is, there's this type of happiness that I think that we overlook, especially people in my field, I'm a psychologist, because we think so much of happiness as being a subjective phenomenon, but I would like to also argue that there is some happiness that exists, like dark energy between us, for which we all have a collective responsibility. And you find this, for example, uh, John Hellwell has done a recent analysis. When people move from a low happiness country and they immigrate to a high happiness country, they just become happier. They didn't go through a, a character education program or take mindfulness training. They just became happier. You find this uh, in, in the affective contagion research. When one person is happy, those around them tend to be happier. So I think that it is worth our while to look at this, this collective or shared happiness and just extend beyond this individualistic notion. Uh, in our chapter, which I hope you enjoy reading, um, we looked at, at three different social level variables. We chose them because there is a, um, an existing body of research on each, there were relatively decent case studies on each, and they seemed like topics that would not be entirely foreign to policy makers. Uh, so connection, trust, and safety. And here I really like the idea that, that for policy makers who may be reticent to, to take on such a, a new agey and fluffy topic as happiness, the idea that lower speed limits, uh, proximity to green space, pedestrian walkways, those are happiness interventions. With trust, the idea that you can promote public trust by passing laws censuring corruption, both in the public and private sector, that you make government budgets transparent and open, that you move increasingly to a digital form of government and that that lowers corruption, as in the case of Estonia, where they watched corruption plummet because it's just much harder to bribe a computer than it is the, the middleman who you want to, to activate or put you in the front of the queue to turn on your utilities. And when you find lower rates of, of corruption and higher rates of government transparency, lo and behold, you find greater well-being, which then in turn also has a trickle-down effect to all these individuals. That is, I believe that, that 
the good society, the society that enjoys high well-being is more than just the aggregate of the happy citizenry, that there is this also emergent other social level uh, of happiness. Um, and to do you a, a small kindness, I'm just going to skip uh, to the end. The chapter has, and I will not um, say them in any detail, but a number of case studies, um, but they, they are things like in Victoria, in Australia, where uh, a quarter of the people live alone, where an aged population increasingly feels isolated. There are wonderful programs where foreign students can be paired with elders who live alone and it solves a, a problem for both of them. And I think the world is abundant with these kind of innovative programs. Some will work in some places, many will have to be modified to be made locally uh, appropriate to, to cultural constraint. But ultimately, I would like to leave you simply with the thought that we don't need to think about my happiness, that I don't want you to think about your happiness. I'd rather you think about our happiness. Thank you. And I want to pick up on that, though. You talked about happiness interventions and talking about how people can make their cities a bit better in terms of the green spaces and the walkways and things that are somewhat obvious once you have them, I think, in place. Dr. Aisha, I was just wondering if you wanted to pick up on that. Yes. Uh, I think I'll go also to use my slides. Thank you, my dear. Uh, it wasn't a, an easy job to put a chapter about uh, happy cities. Cities varies by sizes, uh, uh, geographically. Uh, cities are all over the place. Before going to our slide, I want to show you this picture. I saw this picture in my dad's archive, and I was asking him, what was Sheikh Zayed, the founder of UAE, doing here in this picture with this Bedouin guy? He said, Sheikh Zayed went through a very harsh uh, time with us. He lived the harsh uh, period here in UAE. And that's why he promised the first project to be developed in this nation is housing. Once people have shelters, they will feel safe. And then they can grow. And prosperity will grow in our country. And this was the picture when it was the first housing project being uh, 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 handed over to uh, this Bedouin guy in Al Ain. His name was Salem Al Amri. And just this picture will tell you in any city, in any government, if there isn't any basic needs, it will be difficult to uh, ask citizens to be more happier. So basic needs are equivalent to any other kind of needs when we are talking about happiness. Normally, when we talk about cities, this picture will come out. Buildings. Anytime we go to any uh, conference, they will put this picture about cities. But cities is not buildings. Cities is about us, people who are living in these uh, uh, cities. That's why when we start to ask ourselves, what makes happy cities? It's us, people. And not only what make happy cities as cities, normal cities. In this smart world, where connectivity make all these cities become uh, small villages connected to each other. In our chapter, we, we, we try to capture as much as possible of stories that make cities uh, more happier. Because yes, we can make our cities more happier. When we go to the level of cities, there are loads, lots of uh, uh, stories and opportunities that we saw that these cities make their people more happier. And also, when talking about cities, we need to cover all sectors in our cities, whether it be economy or people or government, mobility, health, education. We, we can't say we will talk about a city uh, in general. We need to see all, uh, all these sectors, how, how they are developing uh, systems and policies around promoting uh, happiness. And we find very interesting examples. 
examples like in keto, no harassment. When they collected data about why people they are not using public transportation, 84% of people, they tend not using public uh, transportation or public spaces. And with a small enhancement of their system, introducing an SMS solution that ladies can send uh, an SMS to the government or supervisors who are being trained how to handle harassment cases, an alarm in every station if there is uh, uh, an SMS being sent from that uh, station, the alarm will come out. And by then only, ladies and young, young women start to use uh, transportation solutions and they, they felt more safer and they felt that someone is taking care of them. Another project it's from here, from Dubai, called SHAPE. It's a tool to measure uh, happiness in our smart uh, projects. Collecting data from the city KPIs and happiness, we can measure how much these projects can add to the happiness of our people, specifically around each sector. If this project in mobility, how much percentage of happiness it can add to, uh, to, uh, to people. It's been verified by our stakeholders and it's been tested, and now it is in the plan to add it to the city dashboard tool. And many, many cases, and I uh, uh, encourage you to, yes, you can take one of these booklets, but for other, whoever is traveling, I know this will be a heavy uh, uh, gift to take it, to carry it with you. So download it from the website, I believe tomorrow, they will share with you the link of the website once it has been uh, announced uh, officially. Uh, part of the findings, we find that data is so much important for city. In Quito case, without collecting data, they will never find out why people don't use public uh, 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 transportation. By collecting data, measuring, influencing uh, 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 the process, then responding uh, to, uh, to the findings, closing the feedback loop, this is only where we can really make changes. Data by itself cannot do a thing. But when you bring data and inject it to the decision-making process only, you can get your project done. Similarly, trust. When building trust with people, then we can promote for happiness. When people trusted Sheikh Zayed, then he, can serve them, then he could serve them happiness and hope. Similarly, th that was our finding in all the societies and communities and cities, only with the trust. Social trust and transparency, people can be more happier. And also inclusivity. When we include everyone in our projects, men and women coming from every uh, different backgrounds. This is only when we can promote happiness. And also partnership. I know they tend to call it PPP, public and private partnership, but here we call it public, uh, private, and people partnership, wherein people and private sector come together with public sector to promote uh, happiness. These are our findings, and we hope by next year we can produce even more uh, uh, in-depth uh, studies and research about these uh, four uh, topics. Uh, and I believe the most important thing is how to bring the rest, the 173 countries from the 22 uh, countries that uh, OECD covering, uh, to believe that happiness can be served if it is put in a proper uh, uh, framework. Thank you. Martine, I think that was a perfect point to pick up on there because we're talking about data and you have all of the data apparently. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, so we heard very interesting case studies and experiences in some specific sectors, health, education, all in some levels of um, our lives where we live in cities, 
and so on. So what I'd like to uh, do now is to kind of bring this to the national level. What are governments doing at the national level in order to bring all this together and actually take well-being as the, you know, at the heart of their uh, political uh, agenda. So um, essentially, um, the chapter, what the chapter does is to um, focus on this idea of putting happiness and well-being at the heart of policy, at the level of the, you know, of the government, the core government. And for that, we've used some concrete uh, case studies to look at um, how data on well-being, the statistics that have been collected, have been developed first, and then second, used to inform policy. You know, we come, I come from the OECD. The OECD, our motto is essentially to um, provide evidence for policy making, and policy making to do what? To design policies for better lives. And so we put really well-being at the center of what we do. So the, the chapter, as we said, uh, documents experiences in more than 20 countries, actually 22, we've been, now we've said 22 um, uh, countries. And it details really what countries have done in terms of developing measurement frameworks. So we look at measures, 13 of them have developed very comprehensive frameworks for measurement. 10 countries have also been very serious about these measures and actually developed beyond the measurement framework policy frameworks on how they go about using these frameworks for policy, and I'm going to say more in a minute. And then in an appendix, we looked at seven really case studies in depth. So you can take the book again, carry it in your um, luggage going back, or download that from your website. So let's look um, very quickly at the experiences in the development of the metrics. We start from what has been said all along, and Jeff has repeated that, that what has driven the countries really into developing these metrics of well-being is the fact that GDP, that has been the focus of policy for so long, growth, economic growth, is not a good metric of people's well-being. For a long time, we thought that let's grow. This, this growth is going to trickle down and will improve the lives of everybody. We know this is wrong. We know this is not true. OK, so that's the first uh, principle. Then, then, if not, what do we need to measure and to understand and to document, not only for governments, by the way, but also for people, for citizens, um, to understand the state of the people's situation? So that's also what underlies those met metrics, these frameworks. What is important, and something perhaps we have not uh, discussed enough um, until now, is the fact that who are we, we experts, to decide what matters to people in people's life? Okay? So let's ask them what are the most important dimensions in life, aspects of life that matter to them. And most of the countries that have actually developed those measurement framework have actually run very large consultations. So they've gone to the public, they've had town hall meetings, they've run internet um, surveys and so on, and they said, what makes you happy? What improves your well-being? So we heard that work is important, that your health is important, but what else? Social connections, but maybe there are other things. So let's ask the people, because they are the best place to say what matters to them. So in the end, all those well-being frameworks are actually what we say multidimensionals, because they tell you what actually drives well-being, what are the most fundamental aspects. And it's not just one or two things. Of course, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we want to know whether people are happy, so subjective well-being has to be included. Measures of subjective well-being have to be included in those frameworks. But interestingly, what we found as well in our chapter is that who took the initiative of this? And that's very varied across countries. In some countries, it's a prime minister's office. In the UK, for instance, it was David Cameron, the prime minister, who launched the National Wellbeing Initiative. In some other countries, it was parliament who started 
the initiative. In some other countries, it was one specific ministry that started the initiative. So that's very varied. At the end of the day, we believe, and that will be one recommendation, that it has to be brought under the umbrella, probably of the prime minister or president's office, because this has to be a whole of government approach. The minister, she was here a moment ago, she just left, and she said, let's talk about the whole of happiness approach. And I think we have to talk about the whole of happiness and the whole of government approach. So, uh, at the OECD, we've been pioneering uh, this work, and by and large, most of the frameworks, I'm not going to detail it, it's too, uh, too, too late in the day, that wouldn't make you happy if I went in detail into all this. But what we say is that you have to look at exactly the, the th sort of thing that you have been hearing so far, which is, of course, material conditions, we heard about that, but your jobs, the quality of your job, work-life balance, education, the quality of your education, uh, the social connections, Something we haven't heard a lot about, but of course the environment, you know, the air you, you breathe, the water, the quality of the water, whether there are parks in your uh, surrounding, the housing conditions, and so on. And security are very important, but also trust uh, is also very important. Anyhow, you, you, we need to, to collect data on all of this uh, dimension. So let me now move on to what the chapter looks at in, in also in details and based on case studies. So, okay, we've collected this data, all right, so now we know the situation. We have a diagnosis. We know, we, we can even look over time whether things are improving in all of this. Is that useful? Is that, for, I mean, encouraging government to change their policies or not? Well, well, the answer is not that straightforward, okay? so. Um, what we see is that, yes, it provides a more complete picture. So, you know, it report on many more things, informs the policy debate, it fosters discussions within government. In some countries, it actually even supports strategic um, uh, alignment of outcomes, so you want to make sure that you have a direction, a vision, you want to improve the well-being of people. It also highlights inequalities in the diversity of experiences. It promotes evaluation, um, impacts, um, and, and accountability also. But this is kind of, I mean, all this is happening, but I would say we are at early, early uh, ages of this process. So we've tried to kind of conceptualize this. And we looked at seven particular case studies. They are listed here. New Zealand, Ecuador, Scotland, United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Sweden. And we say, where are they in this policy cycle? From agenda setting, from policy uh, formulation, from implementation, monitoring what's happening, evaluation, ex post, ex ante, and how is it, uh, where countries situate themselves? And you can see, they are almost all over, which means some countries are essentially using these well-being indicators for diagnosis, so setting the agenda. Others are really serious and you know, putting it into policy formulation, implementation, monitoring what's happening. Others go even beyond, and they do those ex-ante assessment when you have a policy intervention. Do you look at the impact it will have on the well-being of people, ex post, and after the intervention, uh, after the information exposed or ex ante before you actually conduct your intervention, you're looking at possible uh, impact. So we've seen all sorts of different uh, approaches. So what are the commonalities, challenges, and differences? And what we see is that A, those, uh, many countries are developing those, um, those indicators. Of course, they include subjective well-being, but not all. So we have to see that well-being is a still a concept that uh, people come from different perspective and they look at the drivers but they don't go all the way to happiness or some do but some don't. So it's, we, we're still not quite there uh, in terms of where um, national governments are doing. They use uh, indicators at different stages of the policy uh, cycle. Importantly, I think, context matters. And uh, in the countries where there is a leadership, where it's in the cabinet's office. I think they've gone, like in the UK, where there's a green book, for instance. These countries have gone further into uh, implementing a well-being uh, agenda. But as I said, 
Uh, and that's uh, my last point here in terms of the lessons learned from country experiences, is that we are really in early days of policy use at the national government level. We've seen that in, you know, ministers of health can use some of, um, of this um, material, Minister of Education, but what we heard is more practitioners. We heard examples about, you know, health practitioners, or we heard example about uh, business, which is not government, it's about the business. And there, or in cities, mayors can do things. Is it going to then go to the national level? And that's what we're trying to um, you know, convince governments. And we hope that this book that everybody will read will be an advocate for pushing the agenda a little bit uh, further. So what's next? Next, for next, um, report, what we want to do is we want to understand really uh, better what are the constraints, what is blocking uh, in government, in the machinery of government, what is it that prevents government to embrace this agenda. You talk to government, they all say we want to improve the well-being of our people, I mean of our citizens. So why is it that they continue to look at your charts and GDP and the stock market and don't put that at the heart, at the top of their agenda? So what is it that doesn't? And so we need to look at the machinery of government, how decisions are taken, parliament, the interaction between parliaments and governments, and the bureaucrats, how, what's happening there to understand better? So we can identify ways to overcome those barriers and perhaps be more um, you know, bold and provide you tools, concrete, like a toolkit. Okay, let's do it. We're going to tell you how to do it. And that's what we would hope to do for next year. Thank you very much. I think it works out pretty well for John to kind of wrap us up in the next 10 minutes or so and potentially give us a few opportunities for more questions. Um, but in just in terms of hearing that, in terms of data and, and really being able to speak to governments about how these metrics and the areas in which you've decided to ride on, whether it be mental health or cities, how that can make people's lives better, how do you convince governments, other than what's happened here in the UAE, that this is the best way forward? It, it's one of the big questions we faced, is how do we structure our investigations to make a set of outcomes that tells a story convincingly and, and makes it uh, all hang together. Uh, I think I was going to set it up by just telling a story, and in a way that a story is what's required to do it. Everybody needs a convincing story or an example that makes reality where they live. One of the things that was in common across all the chapters was that they all focused on a social context. And they all recognized they were in a silo by their chapter, but, except the cross-cutting chapters, but they realized they didn't belong in a silo. And that's true for government policy as a whole. It has to treat the setup as a whole, but they often deal with bits. So how do you make it work so it makes sense in bits, but yet it handles the whole? Let me tell you one story that I think shows what can be done and how it can be done. And it's picking up an example that Jan gave earlier um, and it, called the Upskill Project. Well, it had it all in some sense. The project was actually financed by government on an experimental basis. It was actually financed by the firms that did the training. But the research part of it was financed by government. That's very important. Government has to encourage learning in this area. The critical thing was these firms collaborated across the industry to design a program in context and collaboration with educational institutions. And they designed it to produce life skills in the workers on the workplace. And they knew the workers would take these life skills and work somewhere else but they drew back from their narrow self-interest, and they felt very good about this, by cooperating to actually commit, per, permit these people to have skills that gave them better lives, wherever they may be. And they, they wanted that to feed back into the industry in a way, so they said, okay, it was the hotel industry, and they said, okay, let's 
looking at conventional outcomes, let's things that sort of matter in that. So what do people write on the room cards? Do people come back later uh, with the people that have had these trainings? There's basic skills, why should they come back again? But they did. And so, even, so what, what was important here was they set up these plans to look at life the way it is lived by the individuals. They're trying to help the individuals. And the individuals are contributing, right? They're going through this training process themselves. So everybody gave, everybody came to the table. They all knew they were cooperating from the outset. They were not in it just for themselves. So the whole level of, you could see it, the description of the project, the way it was done, everybody felt better about this. They were investing in a possibly better world. And they got very nice results for it. And they more, much more than covered the uh, costs of the program and left these people much better equipped for the future than they were. Were these people actually happier after than before? Not significantly so. But all the other outcomes, standard health outcomes, education outcomes, they were, they, were, they, were all they were all better. But the important thing was all these sectors of society had come together in order to work to produce or play in some of these cases uh, to produce a better society. Now this was done, and this is important because most of the OECD countries have not done this, they don't actually support well-being research. This project, I have to say, wouldn't have had a well-being focus if I hadn't been on the board of the nonprofit who was actually hired to do the research. I insisted, if this is going to help the world in the long run, you have to set up and monitor the well-being outcomes of this, including workplace trust and so on, when you do it. They did, and they showed moderate well-being outcomes. But then the, the, the prize outcome of the whole thing only was existed because it was done in this collaborative, research-oriented, everybody in it context. We broke down the benefits. Where were the workplaces where the really big gains appeared? It turns out all the gains were in the high trust workplaces, all of them. And so you couldn't have had a stronger support for the point that Robert was making and it's implicit in most of the other parts that the social fabric which is so important to people's well-being is, is supported by and requires a real sense of people looking after each other. And one of the fundamental measures of that is would you help me if I was in times of trouble? Would you return my wallet if I dropped it? Would you protect me in the work environment if I made a mistake? Would you help me avoid a mistake? Would you tell me, even though you're my inferior in the, in the structure, would you tell me when I was about to make a mistake in the operating room? Everything that creates these more social structures produces better outcomes. It's just one story, and I'm stopping here to leave some time because the way you learn in this, I learn anyway, is to hear from you what you think was missing from what we did so we can fix it next year. Some questions, I know there's a couple of gentlemen up here in the back. I, suppose I run the New Zealand project, which was one of your seven case studies. Uh, we run it through the New Zealand Treasury and in reference to your previous comment, we have a very, very ungrumpy Minister of Finance who is making sure that well-being is very definitely the centre of what New Zealand is going to do. So, uh, subsequent to the work that you've done there, we are going to produce a report um, by the end of this year, which is equivalent to our economic and fiscal sort of report, which is a well-being report as a centre of our budget, and make the budget itself um, centred around well-being. Right, so that quite a lot of my sort of day job is to think about the grind of government, the kind of issues that uh, Madame Lagarde was talking about here in terms of how do you make this actually work within government. Um, and my one real comment is to suggest to you that um, the focus on the particular chapters, the particular subject areas will not deliver for you if what you want to do is to see central governments drive this, and particularly places like ministries of finance, drive this so that the money is consistent with the objectives of improving well-being, the way government spends money. It has to be the kind of, um, the kind of macro overview 
that was, was offered by Madame Lagarde there in terms of thinking about that overview side. And that the, the challenge I would offer you, so you asked me for the cha you asked for challenges here, the challenge I offer you is to think very, very hard when you say the phrase, you are replacing GDP. Because I think quite often that opens up a vast array of different things that people want to think about, many of them which aren't actually about the way GDP is used in practice and the way government works. So if you're wanting to replace GDP as the way that government organizes itself and thinks about its task, you, it needs a much greater focus on the way that government operates, which is uh, where the description was there. I, I agree that that would be uh, very important. And, there, and then the question is, what strategy do we as advocates adopt in order to get that? The one that's my favorite is to say, as long as what you're doing is good and for a good purpose, it will be, it will be there in the new framework, but we're just giving you a bigger umbrella under which that's located. We're not abandoning GDP, we're just admitting, as you all admitted when you went home for dinner, it's just part of the story. It's an important part of the story. You don't have to give up what was your day job, but you have to rethink it and put it in a, uh, in, in a bigger framework. I also agree that the idea of having all the players in, involved is a really big deal. The experiment I talked about came about without any high-level government buy-in, just enough, just at the right place, to allow these experiments to go forward, to make them become more general, to make them become, to, to spread, to give legitimacy to those in the departments who really would like to do it, really requires uh, leadership at the top to give people the capacity uh, to do that, I agree. John, can I just say of something? Of course. Sorry. Um, I mean, that's a very important point, of course. Especially, I mean, in New Zealand, it's the Treasury that actually initiated the, the Living Standards Framework. So that's quite remarkable to some extent. And we're following, of course, New Zealand very carefully at the OECD because we want to learn exactly how you're going to implement this new um, revised um, uh, well-being framework. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and we're not, you know, in the... In, as John said, there's no idea that you should replace necessarily GDP. This is, we're replacing GDP. We just say, don't put the sole focus on your policy. I mean, don't use GDP as a sole focus of your GDP. And certainly not as the end, um, sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the ultimate objective of your policies. It's a means to an end. So we're not saying throw out GDP. But by putting everybody around the table, you may discuss, and that's what probably what you're going to be doing in New Zealand, you will discuss different interventions. You look at the impact of this intervention on GDP, but also on inequalities, for instance, because GDP says nothing about the distribution of the, um, what you are creating, okay, in terms of resources, or whether there is an impact on the environment, or whether it's creating social um, you know, a disrupt, disruptive social uh, uh, implications of GDP. And then it's for government to decide. You look at those trade-offs, and governments have to, to decide, make those trade-offs every day. That's what they've been elected for, right? So, but that's, that's a conscious then, and they have to explain, and they have to be accountable for that. And they say, we made this decision, it will increase GDP, but it will also increase inequality. And so, bon, voila, that's what's happening. The other possibility is that you will have win-win because you can both increase GDP but also preserve the environment. And perhaps that's a better solution than an alternative solution that would have just looked at GDP. That's sort of the framework we're thinking of in terms of how do you, cha you change your approach of doing things. Explicitly have these this trade-offs explicit and be accountable to the public for the trade-offs that you have in the end decided to make. I do believe also here uh, that uh, with all the uh, use cases that we've uh, uh, put in our chapter, that when the end goal is well-being and happiness, the whole cabinet, the whole government will make sure to reach to that end goal, no matter of whatever policies they have to put or budgets or partnership with the, with the different uh, parties. If the end goal is well-being and happiness, then they will make sure, and they are accountable uh, with that, then they will make sure that it is embedded in all uh, their uh, uh, elements and projects and uh, uh, policies. I think we have right here. So uh, there was a couple of times where the moderator attempted to uh, get you all to talk more about technology. 
uh, and and how kind of because there's obviously ways of using technology that can be bad for people's health that people can be particularly worried about in relation to education and children growing up and companies trying to maximize the addictiveness of their devices and so on. Uh, do, do, do you think it, it is just too early for us to address that topic because the technologies themselves are moving so fast so if we try to address what to do now it might be outdated in a couple of years or, 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 or what do you, do you think this is something we eventually we need to think about in a in sort of from a public policy and regulation sort of perspective whether there are certain things that companies shouldn't be allowed to do in their product and so on and so forth. As, as you know when you're driving a car if the thing is moving fast, it's important to respond quickly and not slowly. <laughs> Technology is moving fast. It means the research and the response, ability to respond has to be developed even faster. Uh, for the World Happiness Report, which is in some sense the broader research adjunct and measurement vehicle that, that, that partners with the world, uh, the global policy uh, report, uh, we're having a chapter in the next year's one on social media and their effect on happiness. There is a growing uh, research of that sort. Uh, and uh, I am absolutely sure that uh, a well-being framework can help to sort out the social norms that the people involved ought to be using. You know, in the sense they, don't, they realize it isn't quite enough to get slip on the wrong side of something and get caught and say it's, I apologize. It'll probably come from the employees themselves often. It'll come from the customer feedback. It'll come from parents. It'll come from a whole range of things who say, with their ways of making this process work better. The, the technology is here. It's, it's, it's potential is enormous, but its tentacles are so invasive that you can see that here is one more unregulated drug. And uh, he said, well, it is like the other drugs, but it's one we understand much less than the other ones. And uh, all of us have to contribute to both the research and the response. But quite clearly, uh, governments themselves, whether as organizations that support the building of standards or the enforcing of, of, of regulations, from where I sit in the well-being space, the faster and the more completely it can be solved by collaborative action by the people who are creating it and, and, and feeling the consequences much more effective than somebody trying to define a rule and enforce it because they're starting from behind and they'll get beaten. If you don't have the hearts and minds of the people on all parts, it'll be very difficult to do better. But actually in the uh, happy uh, cities, you'll find many examples where in cities, when they start to collect data and implement artificial intelligence on top of them and utilize uh, different type of tools to uh, analyze uh, uh, the data, they could easily uh, intervene and uh, uh, improve the well-being of their uh, uh, citizens. We are implementing similarly here in Dubai also uh, algorithm wherein we are putting some artificial intelligence on the data to see which are the, the projects uh, uh, that will increase uh, happiness of our uh, people. Today, if governments or companies uh, or institute don't utilize these kind of platforms, especially when, when we have a wealth of data we should utilize something like artificial intelligence to predict for us what's next, to analyze for us the situation in much faster mood. Yeah, I can just, um, as a compliment, as John said, the loss of research needs to be conducted on that, and we have to start now. In fact, well, I, at the OECD, we have a project which is called Going Digital for the Wellbeing of Society, and we have a module in that um, project which is the impact of digitalization, AI, and, and so on, on the well-being of people. And we use the framework that I showed very briefly to look at what would be the positive and the negatives, because not all negative. I mean, we should be, you know, we shouldn't be so uh, uh, pessimistic. There are lots of things that will improve, I mean, in, in health, in education, and in, but there are also the negative aspects. So we shouldn't be sort of, uh, you know, saying that everything is good or everything is bad. We have to, to balance and we have to be very careful. And perhaps, uh, yes, people, I mean, who are creating these robots or who is creating this artificial intelligence? People. 
I mean, so we have to think, are we creating this for the, for, uh, the well-being of, of the planet, the well-being? I mean, we, are, we, have a, we still have a brain. I mean, this morning's presentation by Professor, um, um, this, um, professor of, um, a physicist uh, professor, a, phys a, ph a physics professor, uh, I mean, the world he was painting of tomorrow I mean, frankly, I mean, this was Frankenstein for me. I mean, I don't want my children or my grandchildren to live in this world. But they can influence that world. They are the ones who are going to make this decision, the parents, the people, and so on. So I think we are actors of our lives, and uh, we will make a, a something out of artificial intelligence that uh, will be good for us if we are actors of our lives. So there are good things and bad things, and we have to look at those aspects. So unfortunately, I'm being told from all sides that we have to wrap it up. Um, but I'm sure that the authors of this really incredible report, well done, everybody, um, will be available for your questions if you guys want to stick around. So thank you so much, everybody, and, and have a good evening.